Hello and welcome to Travel Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Unseen Histories. It's Violet here. In this episode, we're putting on our finery and going to a wedding. Indian weddings are famous for their exuberance and that of Prince Nornihal Singh, who got married in 1837, may well have been the most extravagant of all time. This lavish, month-long celebration was an emotional moment for the young prince's grandparents, Ranjit Singh, the Lion of Punjab, Maharaja and founder of the splendid Sikh dynasty that ruled northern India from 1799 till 1849, and his beloved wife, Maharani Datta Kaur. They oversaw the wedding preparations and presided over the whole extravaganza, which was as much carefully orchestrated political theatre as it was the union of two people before God. While the guests feast and the dancing girls performed, Ranjit Singh and his advisers were busy negotiating with representatives of the East India Company over the division of power in the Punjab and beyond. Our companion at this extraordinary event is Dr Priya Atwal, whose new book, Royals and Rebels, The Rise and Fall of the Sikh Empire, aims to inspire a new kind of conversation about this compelling dynasty by looking at the sources in a different light and considering a wider range of players than has traditionally been done. In the Sikh empire, women played a more active role than has previously been appreciated, often acting as regents on behalf of their children or ruling alongside their husbands. Priya brings their stories to life here and reveals Sikh history in its full glory. I spoke to her the other day. Welcome to Travels Through Time, Priya. Hi Violet, thank you for having me. Um, I'm looking forward to our conversation today um, because we're going to be talking about a wedding and I think that is just what we all need on this extremely grey, miserable winter's day. Um, But before we get into that, um, can you tell us a bit about um, your wonderful book which is called Royals and Rebels, The Rise and Fall of the Sikh Empire? And in it, in your introduction, you say that you want to start a new conversation, a different conversation about this period in history. And um, I'm assuming it has been written about um, a lot by both British and Indian um, historians. So can you just talk a little bit about that um, and and what you what you want to do with this book? Well, essentially, the book was quite a fun experience to work on, to write. And uh, it was born out of my desire to, or my interest really actually, to explore the gender history and the cultural history of this particular kingdom and that kingdom's wider role in the politics and culture of 18th and early 19th century South Asia. My interest in it originally emerged as a young undergraduate student at Oxford um, when I first discovered the the, the story of uh, Maharani Jindagor. And that's not to say that I you know, put her on the map. It was just that I had no clue who she had had been before that point in my life. Hadn't encountered her in the school curriculum or at home really before either, despite growing up in a British Sikh family. I was able to go and volunteer for a Sikh heritage charity in the UK in, in the British Library and started to get reading into the Maharani's life story. She's the last queen of the Sikh empire, Maharani Jindagore. And I just was finding very little secondary literature on her. It was incredible. There was reams and reams of stuff in the British Library in the archives about her reign and about her politics and the pivotal clash with the British East India Company in the anglo Sikh Wars. But there was little to be found about her and about other women from that period. Uh, Much to be found about her illustrious husband, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the Lion of Punjab. And he's he's a towering figure in Punjabi Sikh and sort of uh, modern South Asian history. And uh, it just seemed that this kind of great man approach to writing history hadn't quite left the Punjab at this for this period of time. And there were so many interesting questions to be asked. Um, and that's what I delved into with my PhD research. And the first half of which is now in this book. So essentially, I, I wanted to 
just throw a few questions out there. If you if you bring some of the, the women, if you bring some of the young children from this royal family set up by Maharaja Ranjit Singh into the picture and you look at their role in the making and breaking of this empire, what does that tell us about the culture, about the politics, about the world of that region, its elite rulership, in a very pivotal period of time for South Asia where new kingdoms, uh, new empires were being forged in the, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Mughal Imperium. Uh, so that's it, trying to bring a human story to a very uh, creative, ambitious period of history. And presumably there's um, lots of British sources and also Indian sources and uh, Afghani sources. I'm, I, I'm probably not using the right terminology, but what, what I, I'm trying to get to the bottom of is this failure to take the female stories into account. Do you think that is something that was a feature of, I mean, we know it was a feature, but I know it was a feature of the British, <laughs> the British way of doing history, but was it also true of Sikh society? So does it kind of, is, is it happening in both types of sources, is what I'm really trying to ask? Well, essentially, for the, for the sources of that period, it's not that women aren't mentioned. Uh, and this is what surprised me when I started to go through the sort of uh, more recent secondary literature and the historiography on this kingdom in particular. Um, women do crop up across all of these, you know, different sources in different languages and written by different uh, people from different backgrounds. But often it's in a slightly, shall we say, covered up sort of a way in that. And I, I don't mean that in a we're hiding the women away on purpose as a conspiracy. It's often in a slightly conservative fashion. For example, in some of the Persian sources, you won't find women referred to by name. Uh, the, the courtly sources, the courtly histories and the accounts written by the servants of the Maharaja, for example, in the 19th century in Punjab, in and around Lahore, were all written in Persian. That was the court language of the region. And often you'll find women referred to never by name, but by these kind of honorific titles the glorious lady given to the veil of chastity, or something like that. And then in, in British colonial records, there's all sorts of other things going on. There's, you know, women are often stereotyped according to sort of Orientalist mindsets that were prevalent at the time. But that's not to say that certain British colonial officers or writers at that time weren't interested in the role of women. There, while there was a lot of stereotyping going on, there were others that were sometimes interested in the odd queen that might have something good to say about her. And so what you had to do, what I had to do, was, was read a lot of these sources against the grain and, and really try and understand, well, OK, what was the lady behind the veil of chastity up to? What was she mentioned as, <laughs> as doing? <laughs> and, and that often tended to be quite significant. She might be educating a young prince. She might be collecting up taxes. She might be distributing cannons to, uh, you know, a, a battlefield. So... Even though the queen in, in, in the scenario might not be named, um, you can start to, through contextual evidence, figure out who that person might be. And then with the British colonial records, OK, some of the more literary stuff might be quite derogatory about Indian women of that time. But uh, in the British Library, for example, we have extensive pension records for many of the queens of Ranjit Singh's kingdom. And again, those were able to give me an insight into their dates of birth, their family origins, their land uh, control over land and pensions and that sort of stuff. And slowly, slowly, I was able to start piecing together a picture of who these women were and just how extensive their role was within this polity. And then when you start seeing that, they're everywhere. And essentially, you can start building a map of, of who they were and what they were up to. And that is what I wanted to contribute with this book, because uh, initially I was just interested in one queen, the most exceptional uh, dramatic story of Maharani Jindagor at the end of the Sikh Empire. But even, you know, as I went on, I realised there's so much more to this story. And uh, that's why I was determined to publish the names of as many queens as I could find in Royals and Rebels. And so it sounds like they did lead at times quite active lives and did and did have a certain amount of power. And you're talking about them distributing canon. I mean, that sounds like a very, <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know how to put it, belligerent? I, no, uh, <laughs> active thing to be doing. Definitely. Um, so can you just tell us a bit about uh, Sikh society and, I mean, obviously we're talking about the queens, they're in a very different position to um, the people at the bottom of society, but can you just give us a, a sort of flavour of uh, the role of women generally in Sikh society? So one thing to bear in mind is that Sikhs, the Sikh community in, in sort of early 19th century Punjab, which is when 
the, the Sikh kingdom really kicked off, um, they were still a minority within the broader population of, of Punjab and of northern India. And Punjab today, of course, is divided between India and Pakistan. But in that point in time, it was, we can, you know, under Ranjit Singh, it was a, it was a region, a, st- a state that was reaching to the borders of Afghanistan and Tibet. I mean, you've got different smaller Indian princely states that were subsumed within that, the Punjabi hill states, for example. But the Sikhs were the third community, really, in terms of religious uh, numbers. But and that so, so sorry, there was the Hindus and Hindus and Muslims and, and, and Muslims. OK, yeah. But you also had Buddhists, you also had Christians, yeah. Jains, various other people, too. Um, so Sikhs were in, in the mix, essentially, but they weren't the dominant religious community. Um, but the Sikh, the Sikh faith was also relatively young. It had emerged at, towards the end of the 15th century and it had only been a century or so, you know, from, from when Ranjit Singh conquers Lahore and makes it his capital, from when the last Sikh guru, Guru Gobind Singh, the last of 10 gurus, uh, was, was, had, had died and had previously decreed that there would be no further human spiritual leaders for the, for the Sikh people after him. So it was a time of great flux that Ranjit Singh's ancestors or his, his father and grandfather and his female relations were all building up this territorial base that he eventually turned into an empire. But within, within Sikh society, there had been this kind of, one of the, one of the key aspects of, of its sort of religious and political ethos was a really radical form of egalitarianism. The ideas of caste, of gender, of, of even religious divide should be dispensed with in many respects and that everyone is, is equal under one God or essentially not just under one God, that that one God is, is diffused amongst all, everyone, everything, essentially. So that creates a bit of a tussle when you have this idea of a, of a king emerging in the midst of that because, of course, it's a different sort of conception of kingship to um, maybe other parts of, of the world where you have a king and a state. Definitely under the last guru, Guru Gobind Singh, you also saw women participating in martial training, in guerrilla warfare and in military leadership. And that continued, you know, ordinary women, we're not talking about elite women, devout, uh, pious women that were willing to become warriors, essentially, uh, and to combat the persecution that Sikhs were facing against uh, Mughals and local Hindu kings that were worried about the political threat posed by the Sikhs. And that continued, essentially, into the 18th century. And and to the point where you see that Ranjit Singh's mother-in-law, for example, his second mother-in-law, he has multiple. (laughs) He goes on to have 30 wives. So even I lose track of all the (laughs) mother-in-laws. But she, she was, you know, a, a, a heading up a warrior clan of her own, the Ganeya Missal, who was a, a rival but neighbouring clan to Ranjit Singh's family. And she leads troops into battle just alongside him when he goes to conquer Lahore in 1799. But what you tend to see throughout this period is, and maybe we can get into this a bit more later, but the role of women does shift. It becomes much more settled and it becomes more complicated for women to rule or, or wield political power in their own right. And it becomes kind of subjugated to this male-driven centre of this new lineage that starts to emerge. Throughout this period, you see women actively working alongside men in fields, having a dominant, you know, an important say in families, even continuing to hold control over forts. I, I remember reading one brilliant moment in, in the courtly records where Ranjit Singh goes and has an argument with his aunt, his mum's brother's wife, uh, to wrestle control of a fort that she just was stubbornly refusing to hand over to him. So this, these women crop up time and time again. And I was only able to scratch the surface with my book, to be quite honest. I think there's plenty more to find. Wow. Um, and that's amazing. I wonder how that played out with the other religions. And then, of course, the East India Company, not famous for their... Um, promotion of women's rights so do you think that also affected this gradual settling down of women's role in the Sikh empire well this is this is the story that I trace in the sort of second half of the book essentially I mean of course in the book I focus on on the queens um so I haven't shone a light deeply on the experiences of ordinary women Hindu Sikh or Muslim or otherwise in the Punjab too much within this book what is known is that there were women from all different backgrounds, all different classes, religious communities, regions of this burgeoning empire 
who were married into Ranjit Singh's family, to Ranjit Singh himself and then to his eldest sons and one of his grandsons who succeeded him. And that, that was part and parcel of the making of this kingdom, essentially, that enabled Ranjit Singh to forge links with families and, and communities throughout the, the whole kingdom. And that that was transformative for the local kind of political fortunes or, or financial fortunes of those families that were located in villages all over the place. But in terms of the changing status of women politically in this period, you know, as you asked, it, it does become complicated. And you see that become increasingly messy in the history, historical sources that you have at the time, particularly when um, after the death of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, there's a succession struggle within the family at the top in Lahore. And there's a, you know, his eldest son and then his grandson, who were the kind of expected heirs of the family, Gurik Singh and Nonahal Singh, who will come, who will come back to you with this wedding a bit later. Mm. <laughs> they die very quickly after his death. In they die in eighteen forty, uh, and then literally within five days of each other, Gurik Singh dies seventeen months after his father for under mysterious circumstances. And then even more strangely. Prince Nonhal dies on the day of his father's funeral as masonry falls on top of him. There's a power struggle thereafter because his mother, Jandagor, Gorak Singh's wife, take, tries to take over as a queen regent, essentially, in her own right. And a power struggle ensues because uh, Ranjit Singh's other son, his second son, or reputed illegitimate son, um, also launches a challenge for power against this Maharani. And there is where the kind of gender politics becomes, for the first time, incredibly toxic. Because he, Shir Singh, this this kind of rival prince, makes the claim that a woman should not be able to rule in her own right. Now, the Maharani was never trying to rule in her own name, essentially. But it would have been that way for a pretty long time, because she was saying that her son, Nonihal, had left several wives behind, one of whom we'll we'll be talking about later, um, who were pregnant. So she was essentially saying, I'm ruling until one of these wives has a child who can then carry on the line of succession. And that had been something that had happened generation after generation within this particular family and within the Punjab more broadly. So there was nothing new about it. But this becomes, you know, something, a theme that you see popping up within the history writing of this period that at this point, women's rule is questioned. And it's not long thereafter that the East India Company becomes increasingly interested in the events of what's going on at Lahore because it becomes so unstable. You know, Jandagore ends up getting a head bashed in with stones and, and, and murdered. And then Shir Singh becomes the Maharaja of Lahore, but then is assassinated. Him and his son are assassinated by people who are seeking vengeance against the Maharani's death. So everything becomes a bit of a mess. And the East India Company does not like this one iota. And already there's a new expansionist urge within the company at this time. They've just taken over Sindh and other places. Um, and that's where you see kind of these early Victorian ideas about uh, particularly Indian gender politics really starting to be injected into the Punjab. Ironically, at the time that Queen Victoria is now sat on the throne. Yeah, didn't she accede to the, yes, in, in the year that you've chosen, which, which we'll go on to next. Yeah, yeah that is ironic. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it becomes a thing that, you, you know, the British East India Company is happy to deal with Queen Victoria on the throne. Um, although not wanting her to get directly involved in Indian politics either, which is interesting, as I found with my other bits of research for the second half of my PhD, that that was something she was very keen to do. They didn't, they didn't approve of Indian women wielding power, and it's Henry Lawrence in particular, a very famous company servant, who becomes very deeply entangled in the politics of Punjab in this period, and who goes toe-to-toe with the last Maharani Jindgore, and really has some very interesting views on, on queenship. He, he strongly believes that although this idea of a harem or barda, the wearing of a veil by a, by a woman, is, is, re- is kind of repressive, he also thinks it's useful <laughs> to keep these problematic Indian women at bay who will just meddle in his ideas for reforming the Punjab and that kind of thing. And so when you see that worldview coming into play in Punjab versus this older kind of cultural ethos where women can have this active role that feel fully entitled to have a say in the politics and the military and the education of of their princely sons it doesn't spell for a very good mix and and in my view that was actually a you know to bring it all round to to a head as your first question in my view that was a completely overlooked aspect of 
the politics of this kingdom that, that then led to its downfall because it was a complete shift in its political culture that was really going to lend itself to disaster, to be quite honest, if, if, you're, if you're too you know, political heads are pulling in completely different directions. So, and it's just an incredibly dramatic story. I think that's why I found it fascinating. <laughs> um, well, that's all, um, that happens in the future. So we're actually going to go back in time very slightly. And um, can you tell us which year you have chosen, please? It was hard to choose, uh, but I chose 1837 for this kingdom. There's so many exciting events in the past, aren't there? I could have been sport for choice. But 1837 I chose... In, the, in this period of history, because it's the kingdom at its peak in all of its, you know, lavish glory. And I particularly chose the month of March. My birthday's in March, but <laughs> I chose it because there's this incredible wedding that goes on for a month. And it's the wedding of Ranjit Singh's eldest, his grandson, the, the, the second heir to the throne, Prince Nonhal Singh. That's what I would like to see. OK, so let's, without further ado, get, get on our smart dresses and our nice hats and um, get to the wedding. Um, get to scene one. Can you tell us where so, we are? Scene one is the 6th of March and it is known as the Vatana ceremony. And Violet, it's, it's quite a good fun, this ceremony, to be quite honest. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, <coughs> it's where... It's, it's one of the kind of... Have you ever been to an Indian wedding before? Let me, let me ask you that question quickly first. No, I haven't. But I have seen, I have seen a couple of films that depict mm-hmm. Indian weddings. Um, but okay. no, I haven't attended one myself, sadly. <laughs> well, let me just briefly tell you. An Indian wedding is not just a day-long event. I mean, in this case, I've just said to you, spoiler alert, that it's a month long. But um, an Indian wedding is normally at least a week or so long in terms of pre-wedding festivities and then the wedding day itself and then after festivities and customs and that kind of thing. It's a real bonding experience between your immediate family and then the family that your, you know, your child or the bride and groom are marrying into. So essentially the Vatna is a, an event held within the immediate family um, and the bride and groom will both do it with their, with their kin in their, in their, in their households. But it's a kind of, um, you could say a pre-wedding self-care ritual for the for the bride and groom. They they are slathered in a sort of turmeric paste, essentially, by all of your friends and family. And it's a ceremonial thing. It's meant to be auspicious. You know, it's it's kind of grooming the the wedding couple. And it's also very it, good for you, isn't it? Turmeric, famously healthy. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, it kind of gives your skin a bit of a healthy glow. It gives you, you know, it's a bit of a pampering thing. But of course, it gets really messy when everyone's just slathering it on your face and your arms and your hands and that kind of thing and your feet. And it's made of normally, well, turmeric, obviously, for the colour, oil, flour and other bits and pieces all mixed together. So you see, and I was just so happy to find this description of this event take place in the in the courtly sources for this period, because it's such a family domesticated, you know, run of the mill event. But to have it prominently mentioned in this history was was really quite sweet. So on the 6th of March, what happened was, is Nona Hal Singh, 16-year-old blushing bridegroom, has his uh, <laughs> Vatna ceremony. And why I loved it, why I wanted to go back in time to this particular event is, you know, I just, you know, I've mentioned already that Ranjit Singh had 30-odd wives, that it was a massive family. And what struck me when I was looking at the, the sources for this period is that so many of the family are mentioned to have attended this event. And it's one where you see them away from all the pomp and glamour of the court and where it was clearly obvious that they were letting their hair down and having fun. And it's one example where that I could find where they were all, well, quite a large number of them would have been gathered in one place. So for me, it would have been fascinating to see, well, who were these personalities? You know, what were they like? How were they interacting? What, what were they like when they were having fun? I mean, how often do you, you get to see that in, in sort of royal history (laughs) that you see all of these characters having a bit of a party you know but in a really more relaxed intimate kind of way and uh so that's that's definitely the first one i'd have to see um yeah and imagine how all those wives got on with each other i mean did they presumably some of them got on very well others there was there there would have been issues um and would they have eaten any kind of special food was there are there any traditions around food and drink at this um particular event or not well, this is the thing. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, my brother just got married last year, uh, you know, post, post lockdown and all of this kind of thing. And it's funny, there's lots of traditions that are handed down to us 
today, right? And we don't know where they come from. Um, and they obviously had a meaning at some point in a village somewhere <laughs> in the Punjab, right? But today we don't know, we just do them. And then not everyone knows how things are exactly meant to be done. But one of the things that I know that we do today, but I don't know whether it was done then. Unfortunately, food wasn't referred to in this um, in this particular snippet of information that I had. But today we, we always have sweetened yellow rice as a kind of a... It's, it's a kind of a, to mark the occasion. And you wouldn't have that otherwise, but it's, it's, it's to mark a joyous occasion. You also have uh, what's called laddu, which is just like a, a little sweet meat. And it's, again, it's just basically sugar and syrup and butter. <laughs> and then <laughs> boiled together and fried. And that you, you so what essentially is, is the phrase mumita. You, you sweeten someone's mouth on a joyous occasion. No, no bitter taste should be left in your mouth when, when everyone's happy. And, and that would be fed to everybody, essentially, but particularly to the bridegroom to kind of congratulate him on, on this completion of this ritual, essentially, as well as to the parents. And in this scenario, you see actually not the boy's parents, you know, in charge of the proceedings. It was the Maharaja Ranjit Singh and his senior queen, mine again, who was Nonihal's grandmother. So, and that, that's quite typical as well, that grandparents sort of take the show. But obviously in this case, you've got the king and queen, as well as the rest of the family. So I think there would have been, to be honest, lots of food on, on tap and, and, and drink and everything else. But those are the key things. It's all about keeping things light and sweet. Yeah, I love the idea of um, having something sweet, a sweet taste in your mouth to sweeten your future. That's great. <laughs> Um, well, I think without further ado, we should um, head for the next stage of the wedding. Scene two, where are we going? Well, now we're a few, two, three days on heading to the actual wedding. Um, the wedding ceremony was held at the Havili, the mansion of Sham Singh Atariwala, who was Noor Nihal Singh's father-in-law. Uh, Noor Nihal was marrying, he was about 16. He was marrying a young girl of about probably 14, uh, Nan Gigor, and she was the, I believe, the eldest daughter of Sham Singh Adariwala. Sham Singh was a very um, illustrious military, uh, well, essentially a warrior in, in, in the Sikh community of this time, and came from a very um, important, noble Sikh family who, you know, had had their rivalries with Ranjit Singh's kin, but were obviously well aware that who the real top dogs were now in, in power. Um, and this would have been a very um, important match between two powerful Sikh families of this time. And as far as we know it, the house was a beautiful house with all sorts of frescoes and paintings adorning the walls. And very little of these kinds of um, buildings, unfortunately, exist, you know, in, in, in good condition today. So it would have been... I think I would have been just intrigued to see what that kind of world was like, you know, beyond the pomp and glamour of the court again, but it's still in a very elegant, noble home, most likely, and in a village within the Punjab rather than one of the main cities. So the, the earlier festivities that I was talking about would have been held at um, Gorbindagod Fort, which was, uh, again, a massive fort that was initially set up by Sikh chieftains, but which was taken over by Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And essentially used as his treasury, so the Kabinor diamond and various other incredible mm. jewels, as well as his his amazing military guns and that kind of stuff, were all minted, forged, and stored in that space. Uh, very close to the holy Sikh city of Amritsar, where he also adorned the leading Sikh shrine, the Harmandir side, with gold and made it the golden temple today. So Amritsar to Atari, the village where the Atari Wala family were based, was not very far at all. Um, it's all in the Amritsar countryside, but these are really kind of, you know, important sites, essentially, in this 30, 40 mile radius. I mean, I just would have been curious to see how the wedding would have gone down as well, really. You know, what was the ceremony like? What were the festivities like as the groom arrives and they receive him and the family? What was the bride like? Because the funny thing I noticed in, in, the, in these sources as well, is late, you know, the, it was all written as a kind of a historical souvenir. Ranjit Singh ordered his courtly chronicler, Sohan Nal Suri, um, he writes this manuscript, the Umdat Uttavarik, in Persian. 
And it's this really, you know, very lavish, but very kind of congratulatory account of the wedding and really celebrating Ranjit Singh. But he rarely mentions the bride. He, he focuses more actually on the kind of Anglo and jumpy discussions that are going on and, and some of the key top dog guests. But I would really love to see what the bride was like, you know, how was she feeling to be marrying into the Punjabi royal family and to be leaving her village and, and, and the life that awaited her and all that kind of thing. So again, fascinating to see the characters, fascinating to see the scenes because these weddings were celebrated in such a lavish, lavish way. So all of the guests, you know, there would have been a lot of people then at this house. Yeah. Including members of the East India Company, and so so the sort of obviously this is a wedding, as you said, um, yeah. and and we focused on the sort of personal element of it, but it's also an alliance, isn't it? And it's a very public event. It's it's so Absolutely. and presumably that's why she's not mentioned because really she's incidental to the proceedings, which is yeah. so sad and tragic. So uh, would there have been thousands of guests there? Well, I think I mean. I don't know whether there would have been thousands of guests, probably into coming up to at least a couple of hundred, at least. Uh, I mean, today's weddings, you can <laughs> easily see that many. But I think there would have been thousands of onlookers, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, oddly enough, we don't know what the entourage was like in a great amount of detail for Nonihar's wedding. But for his father's wedding in 1811, we know that he went with the, 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 the groom's procession, went with no less than 29 elephants. So forget the numbers of people. We need to know how many elephants there were there. Well, that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> and horses, about. you know. <laughs> exactly. And then this um, chieftain whose daughter he's married, you know, has he got a big enough house? That's what I'm worried well, about. Has he, is he going to be able to cater for all the <laughs> elephants? Has he got parking for the elephants? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they would have just set up a massive camp, essentially, yeah. around the whole village. So I think it's not, we can't just focus on the house here. This yeah. is a wedding central, you know, massive uh, festival in some respects, right? Think yeah. think on the scale of Glastonbury, perhaps, or something like that. Yeah, love it. Maybe even maybe even bigger, right? <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, but it. I mean, there's a darker side to this because in in the Punjab, in particular, for for there's a real gender imbalance um, in 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 that, in, particularly in the Sikh community, and that is also because, and this this strikes against the sense of equality that I was talking about that you asked me about in terms of male female relations within the community. There is this worry that if you have a daughter, you know, you will eventually, there is this idea that daughters do not stay in the family home, in the parental home. They are born and destined to be married off, essentially, into a, a groom's family. And all the expense is expected traditionally to be shouldered by the, the bride's family, right? So in some res- within there's, there's, a, there's a real shift against that in Sikh philosophy that, that Guru Nanak in particular said that you should never demand dowry for the for a marriage of a girl or this that and the other and you should keep a simple weddings as simple as possible but then within broader Punjabi culture weddings are a massive deal you know and that it's this expectation that it's not just about the alliance between the family but it's about a celebration and it's about a kind of a showing off of your status and everything that you can do for this new family that you're connecting with so there's this kind of toxic playoff there and I think in some respects, you know, these, these although these, these are political marriages, right, but they, they would have largely have been shorn of the Sikh elements, the kind of more humble spiritual elements. And that, that really is obvious in the, in the sources of that time. The religious parts of things are really just not even mentioned. It's all about the pomp, the festivities, the, the spending, right? And... You know, that's the reason why, of course, Ranjit Singh obviously married his son to a particular noble family. This would have been a huge expense for that family. But I also get the impression from the sources that Ranjit Singh clearly controlled the events and clearly probably paid for lots of things himself. But it was also a show of grandeur for him. And, you know, we're talking about this elephant procession. We do know that he did multiple processions like that and was literally showering gold coins on everybody that was there. So when I talk about thousands of onlookers, yeah, this was a huge event, but it was meant to be a huge event. It was a spectacle to show this big alliance being made, not just between these two families, but also affording a closer one between the East India Company and the, and the, and the Punjabi rulers, who were obviously invited to be prominent guests. Um, and to, to, you know, put that on display in front of all of the people of Punjab, in front of all the who's who of, the, of Northern India that were all gathered for this big event. Yeah, to demonstrate 
their power and um, sort of put them on the map. Hi there, it's Peter here. Unseenhistories.com is now three months old and already it is packed full of enticing, illuminating and excellently presented historical material. If you give the site a visit today, you'll see many beautifully illustrated excerpts of books that we've featured on Travels Through Time. There's excerpts from Malcolm Gaskell's Ruin of All Witches, Nigel Pickford's Samuel Pepys and the Strange Wrecking of the Gloucester, and Gary Shaw's Egyptian mythology, along with many others as well. For those of you who like maps, you might want to check out the utterly compelling series of pieces on the Battle of Fredericksburg in 1862. That was a crucial moment in the American Civil War, along with a range of fabulously colourised images from Jordan Lloyd. It really is history for our times. Unseenhistories.com um, well, let's go to your third and final scene, which I, I think is, is another big opportunity for <laughs> Ranjit Singh to show everyone how wealthy and powerful he is. Yeah, so I picked some big events on this one just because I wanted to, to maximise my opportunity to see lots of people at the same time. Uh, and maybe because, you know, we're coming out of lockdown, we haven't had any big events for, for a long time. Um, but the last event would have been in the last week of March, essentially, um, once all the wedding stuff is done, uh, Ranjit, the, the British guests, uh, particularly Sir, Sir Henry Fane, who was the commander in chief of the East India Company's armies um, and his whole entourage, they, they stayed on until the end of March. And at the end of the month, there was a number of kind of parades, military v- reviews and meet- diplomatic meetings and parties that were held between the East India Company troops and Ranjit Singh's troops and his all of his ambassadors and advisors with, with the British party. One of these events is where Prince Nonhal Singh, uh, the, obviously the, the recent groom, but one of the heirs to the throne, is asked to put on a kind of a display of horsemanship and uh, military um, skill in front of the, the British guests. And, and also just to march past his, his troops, essentially. And so at 16 years old, he's, you know, as a new, newly wedded guy, he's asked to do this. And again, you know, and Henry Fane and all of these guys, you just imagine them sitting there watching him on a chair or something and, and seeing this happen. And, and Ranjit Singh's, you know, keeping an eye on his grandson, so you better not make a mistake here. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. But it, it was all about, I think, this, this is the kind of macho moment for all of these guys, whereas the Vatna and the other bits were much more feminine, much more family orientated, more relaxed. This is the face-off between all these men. And why I was interested in this is because this is also where the discussions start to happen about the tripartite treaty, the, which would eventually become an alliance between the Sikhs, the British, and a deposed Afghan monarch, Shah Shuja al-Mulk, who was from the Sadazai clan and who was trying to regain his Afghan throne in Kabul. And this is where these discussions first start to happen. And also where the British and the Sikhs are really kind of eyeing up each other's military forces. One, to check that it's not worth going to war with each other, definitely. But two, to think about, well, if we are going to go to war in Afghanistan, how, how is this going to work? And this was definitely an idea that Ranjit Singh was very sceptical about. But in the end, it, it does happen. Um, and so in, in a kind of a poignant way, you know, these are, these are the troops, these are the men who you would later on go to see fighting in that very disastrous campaign which had major geopolitical ramifications for British India, the Punjab and Central Asia. And it, it's kind of funny to think that it all goes down or initially starts developing at a wedding. But it was, it was you know, these kind of events were integral to the making of these political alliances at this time, the macho side and the fun family side. Um, and so, yeah, that, that I would have just loved to know what kind of conversations were having being had between Fane and the Maharaja through their interpreters and... What did he really think of Nornihal on a horse? And, and how did Nornihal feel when he was trying to <laughs> perform all this kind of stuff? You know, he's probably like, I want to go home, spend time with my bride. I don't know. <laughs> it must have been, you know, what was going on there? Um, but again, it's just that display of, of the might and the uh, power of these two rival states, you know. And it was, at this point, anything could have happened in the history of this kingdom and the history of South Asia. But the meeting of these two powers who were both, you know, rapidly expanding at this time as equals, I think, would have been a very fascinating moment in history to experience. 
And it picks up on another um, story that I read in your book, which was um, the whole uh, tradition of gift giving, which, um, you know, has been part of, um, I think, most cultures on earth since yep. ever. But um, <laughs> the, uh, the story about the British uh, giving Rajit Singh some dray horses as a present and a carriage because he <laughs> loved horses and he'd never seen um, those kind of horses before. But of course there was, um, there was a, 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 an ulterior motive and that was they needed permission to put them on boats um, to, in order right. to ship them down the rivers. And of course, while they were on the boats, they were busy writing down everything they could notice on the river and navigation and getting, a, a, a t- obtaining data. So I just think that's so, well, interesting and, and 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 like you say this wedding it was a sort of a state uh, uh, on the surface it was a sort of social event but actually they're all starting to negotiate treaties and um it's very interesting Absolutely. yeah there's there's so much going on behind behind all of this and in a way it's like it's, it's hidden in plain sight everyone knows it's going on but they don't want to pretend they want to pretend that it's we're just here for a wedding and we're being polite and this that and the other and i mean as i go on to say in the book that Eventually, when the treaty is signed, it's signed at the same occasion that mine again, you know, the queen who was doing a lot of the leading the ceremonies, Nonihal's grandmother, when she dies. So a British a British political officer comes back, running back to the Punjab in August 1838. It takes a good 18 months for all this to be sorted out, but it starts at the wedding. But when he comes along, he brings the treaty papers with him in his bag, but actually he's got to go and pay his, pay his respects when the Queen's died. So, you know, all of these all of these major political events are taking place in the midst of these really important family occasions. And, mm. and it's, it's not that the family occasions are any less important, actually, to the politics. But, you know, when you... This is the thing, when I was reading about this in older biographies of Ranjit Singh... You just miss the family events altogether as if they never happened. Yeah. And actually, I think, you know, they're actually really conducive to having these kinds of conversations and for this, these kind of relationships to be forged and trust to be built between these different elites who, let's face it, come from entirely different cultures, you know, not just in terms of politics, but even in the way that they eat, dress, move, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So it's a real melting pot of alliance making at this time really yeah and that would have been a very important part of the way that the relationship developed between the british and the rajit singh and 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 anyone else in india in power they had to learn each other's customs they had to learn how to deal with each other that was that was absolutely vital wasn't it yeah yeah and there's some real funny moments in there as well sometimes i think but you see bits in the sources where ranjit singh doesn't know who is the top guy on the British side that he's supposed to be, you know, shaking hands with? Because he's, he's not like, wearing a big turban, so he no, can't he's tell not, who the... He's not wearing a turban. He's like, well, we don't know who their king is or their queen yeah. is, you know. No one's wearing a crown. There's no... No, that's not... no. There's, so there's no one who's an equivalent, essentially, yeah. that you can do like for like with. So he's like, should I go send my sons to receive them? Should I go myself? Am I going to be insulting myself? You know, there's all of this kind of going on. And then the other funny thing is he gets sent a portrait of Queen Victoria and he doesn't know what to do with the portrait of Queen Victoria. And then he makes a joke that, oh, she'd make a really good, beautiful dancing girl. And obviously that is the ultimate insult, right, to any <laughs> British person <laughs> of that time. But it's some also of the... hilarious, the idea of Queen Victoria being a dancing girl. Well, I can't think of well, anyone less it. suited to that. I know. It's so, yeah, I mean, it's a very cheeky thing to say, isn't it, at the end of the day, but... <laughs> So there's all this fun and games going on in the midst of all of this, you know. But it didn't stop him wanting to make an alliance with Queen Victoria. He sent her some very uh, nice Kashmiri shawls, apparently. And and in her journals, I found that he must have at some stage sent some Tibetan sheep. And this was oh. the most random thing I found, um, that there were sheep at Windsor Castle. And one was named Rani, one was named Sultana, and another was named Ranjit. Oh. believe it or not so I don't know what happened to those sheep again but you know how did the sheep get sent over I really how did they survive for one as well um she so probably shipped them up to Balmoral they'd probably be happier up there wouldn't they 
Yeah, well, yeah. Although that was it was Windsor that I saw them mentioned, but maybe afterwards. Yeah, that's another that's another story for another day. Um, and I have to <laughs> I have to ask you because I am not at all familiar with um, uh, this period of history or or, or uh, Indian history or anything. But I did do an episode which was one of my favourite I've ever done, which is in the summer with a man called Edmund Richardson, and he wrote a book about this extraordinary story. This this man James Masson, and he he deserted from the East India Company and travelled mm. around modern day Pakistan and Afghanistan for years and years and years. Anyway, the sinister man who uh, identified him and found him was called Claude Wade. Oh, okay. And Claude Wade, I noticed, was also yeah. the man who came when the Maharani died with the treaty in his back. I just thought that was a, um, yeah, for me, that was a interesting... He, he- Claude Wade was the political agent at Ludhiana, so the frontier post between yeah. sort of British-controlled uh, Sikh states and the the actual Sikh empire. So he definitely would have been the guy keeping an eye on the intelligence network and ferreting out any errant East India Company guys. Yeah, I think he was um, quite an operator. From Oh, definitely. And he was there in the post for 13 years. Again, became very pally with, with Ranjit Singh, but also, of course, was going to be loyal to his bosses, right? So... Um, and that, that was definitely something. They didn't want East India Company men getting over to Ranjit Singh. As much as the two sides pretended to be friendly with each other, the last thing they wanted was was um, runaway British former soldiers getting to Ranjit Singh because Ranjit Singh obviously could then use them to boost up his army, to, to understand how the East India Company works. Yeah, and to boost get up intelligence. And... Absolutely. Um yeah, it's just re- really fascinating. <laughs> so uh, I think now I have to ask you the the uh, the last question, which is, of course, if you could have picked something up from one of these um, moments that we've been visiting today, um, what would it be? I mean, the cheekiest thing that springs to my mind is the Kohenor Diamond, you know, because think... the, the amount of the amount of controversy that's gone on over the time. But I don't know if I'd want to bring that on myself. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it would used it used to be on Ranjit Singh's arm. I would, if for something for me, I would love to bring back something I've always thought about that would be kind of fun is to pick up one of the Maharani's outfits and bring that back with me. You know, they must have worn some really amazing stuff at these weddings. I think that is a brilliant choice, and I wanted to ask you actually on that subject <laughs> in your book that the images in your book, which I hope um, we can put some of them up on the website a selection of them i mean the the fabrics that they're wearing there's a mm. picture of guru nanak and he is mm-hmm. wearing the most beautiful sort of patchwork um robe is yeah. the only way i can describe yeah. it so i think yeah. that's a, that's a really great choice because they had the most incredible craftsmanship didn't they when it came to fabrics yeah. and embroidery absolutely and we you know designers now are starting to look back to that time for inspiration it's becoming much more fashionable it's you know you're starting to see some of these trends appearing in Bollywood movies and that kind of stuff this sort of hybrid Punjabi Mughal Indo-Persian uh, fashion sense but the jewellery the outfits um, you know th- these this was the peak of artisanal uh, artistic craftsmanship not just in and, and, and kinds of uh, and fusion you know there was all sorts of interesting fusion going on um, throughout sort of Indo-Persian design, new new, exciting dynamics happening in the Punjab itself, even bits of European um, styling coming into play. And and you see that everywhere, you know, from, from the chairs that they're sitting in, the, the kind of odd carriages that the British have given to the Maharaja, but that he then remodels himself in, in Indian style. Uh, the uniforms that the soldiers are wearing, you know, in his, his totally refashioned army. Not only is it the military tactics that they use that have changed, but with the French and Italian former Napoleonic officers that come in, they, they introduce these sort of Indian Frankish types of uniform uh, with turbans and, you know, amazing swords and that kind of stuff. So I think the women's outfits in particular, the sad thing is, is that we don't have many paintings of, of women from that time, especially not from life, because of this whole weird conservative element of chastity and and keeping women out of public view but nevertheless we know they were deeply active we know that they were really formidable figures and that they were incredibly wealthy and that they were as i've you know talk about in the book the hindu muslim Sikh queens were all patrons of the arts 
in terms of architecture, in terms of artists for their apartments. So their clothes too, I'm pretty sure, would be fabulous. Absolutely. <laughs> so I would love, I'd love to get an outfit for myself. Absolutely. You could have brought the wedding, the wedding outfit, the wedding dress. Well, she was only 14, so I don't think I'd fit into that. You oh, see? okay, yeah, good point. Good point. <laughs> good point. Um, oh, this has been so joyous, and I really feel like I've been, um, you know, at a happy occasion, smearing turmeric all over my hands and, and in the sunshine. Um, thank you so much, Priya. It's been lovely. Thanks, Violet. It's been really good fun. Thanks for having me. That was me, Violet Moller, speaking to Priya Atwell the other day about her fascinating book, Royals and Rebels, the rise and fall of the Sikh empire. It's on sale now, and if you would like to see some of the stunning images it features and find out more about this and any other of our episodes, please visit tttpodcast.com. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Until next time, goodbye.